Our microbiome is seeded by how we're born. So the very first bacteria that colonize the gut come from either being born vaginally or from the whatever you come into contact with when you're born through cesarean section, which is usually skin microbes. And then from there, how you're fed, uh, so breastfeeding or formula, and then how you're weaned. So the first foods you meet, whether you live in the countryside, do you have pets at home? All these things contribute. Quite flexible at the beginning of life. But then by the time you're about three, which is pretty young, uh, your microbial signature is pretty fixed. But what's really interesting is that in adulthood, even though Obviously, you can't change the early life exposures that you had or antibiotic treatments you've had to take. But you can actually change your gut microbial species. You can fluctuate the, the sort of good bacteria that are, we know are associated with better health by making dietary choices that help to support that. So I, you know, I love this analogy, which is Tim Spector's analogy of the gut garden and this idea that we can change the soil in the garden, we can better its health, we can plant some new seeds and really help to diversify into this beautiful English garden by the foods we eat, adding some fermented foods and really looking after our gut microbiome because it is such an important part of our health, especially when we look at the immune system and the gut-brain axis are the two that are really clear. So we talked about allergies and we talked about the fact that the gut microbiome helps to train our immune system in childhood to know what is and isn't the enemy. And then later in life, the gut microbiome is hugely influential for our mental health. It's hugely influential with how often we get sick and how we recover, but also like our low level chronic inflammation. So we're talking about like mid 30s, 40s, this low level chronic inflammation can have a massive impact on our risk of heart disease. Because if we have inflammation that is sort of always at this low level, especially if you then also have high stress, so your cortisol levels are up, that is how the damage to our vessels, blood vessels takes place. And it's also something that puts us higher risk of metabolic disease later in life, like type 2 diabetes or obesity. And I think one of the things that I was really worried about was I knew my microbiome was not very good when I first met Tim and heard him talk about yeah. Tim Spector, talk about this sort of seven years ago when we were starting Zoe. And I was, I think, very worried that actually I was sort of stuck with it. Mm. Now, you're overseeing more than 100,000 people who've become Zoe members now. Yeah. What are you seeing in terms of like real life ability of people to improve their microbiome by sort of changing yeah. what they eat following this um, becoming yeah. Zoe members? I love this question because I think people do feel, okay, oh, I'm stuck with it now. That's it. But we have to understand that the microbiome has layers. It's like a whole universe in there. So whilst your cornerstone species, the ones that you'll find in your appendix, the ones that like lie in the crevices of the gut, they'll be there for most of your life and they're fairly fixed. But the top layers of the gut microbiome, the ones that kind of are flushed down the loo every time you go to the loo, they're the ones that we can really influence with our dietary changes. And what we've seen at Zoe is that there is real massive change in the composition of the gut microbiome by following Zoe dietary advice for as little as 12 weeks. So we have to unpick the way that the microbiome is structured. The top layer of the microbiome has a massive impact because it still produces all these great chemicals for us, short-chain fatty acids, vitamins, um, amino acids. It produces so much for us. And the things we eat every day impact especially that top layer. So just saying that, oh, well, it's fixed for life, it doesn't take into account the complexity of the structure of the microbiome and the fact that there are cornerstone species that are there for, for sort of for good. And then there are other species that fluctuate every single day. So, you know, there's that really great study, we call it the Singapore study, which just showed that within 48 hours, you can influence what gut microbial species are seen uh, by just feeding people some curry spice mix. So I think amazing. we've seen great data from Zoe members that they have really effectively shifted their gut microbiome composition. Some members have shifted it and they are so proud that their score is higher than Tim's. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this kind of competition. But yeah, of course, we've seen it and we've shown it in our randomized control trial and method that there is this real change in the gut microbiome by following specifically Zoe dietary advice that is really tailored to shift the microbiome composition, to have more of these good bacteria that we know are associated with better health outcomes and reduced risk factors for the diseases that we all want to avoid. And Federica, you mentioned sort of 12 weeks. Does that mm -hmm. mean that the job is sort of done in 12 weeks? So can you mm. transform at this life stage 
No, no, I think it's a really important question, but it, you know, just like a garden, you can't just plant it, make it look beautiful and then just never water it again and never weed it, right? You've got to keep feeding your gut and feeding your gut the food that helps it is also the food that helps you. So it's all connected. We're all one thing, right? What's really compelling is that a gut-friendly diet or a, a, a diet that supports gut microbiome health is also a really healthy diet full stop. And so we have to continue eating in this way to support that gut microbiome diversity and to make sure that our gut microbiome helps to keep us healthy alongside the rest of the impacts that our choices and food has um, on our bodies. And Federica, one thing that really struck me in your in your book, mm -hmm. you say that improving your diet at the age of 40 can add a decade yes. to your life, yes. which is astounding. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm a little past 40 now, but <laughs> can you tell me some more about yeah, that? Yes, so it's a really uh, great modeling study done by a professor called John Mathers, and it's based on a big database here in the UK called Biobank. And they basically looked at baseline dietary patterns in the UK, which are not very good, Jonathan, unfortunately, we're not in a good place. The general kind of baseline isn't great. What happens if you improve it to just the standard dietary guidelines? It, you add sort of six years to your life. Then what happens if you actually take that further and follow what they've called a longevity pattern Mediterranean style diet? So basically add more fruits, more vegetables, more legumes, more nuts, more seeds, and then it shoots up to adding 10 to 11 years to your life at age 40. Amazing. But that study also looked at what happens if you do the same at age 70. So 40 is not a magic number, right? It's like you can add up to 11 years to your life at age 40, but you can add up to six years of your life to your life at age 70. I just want to share that. You're saying you could be 70 years old. Yeah. You're just eating like the average diet mm -hmm. in the yeah. UK or US. Mm -hmm. You can move to like a really good diet yeah. and you can add how many more years? You could potentially add seven years to your life. And now, of course, this is a, a modeling study, but it, it, sh it conceptualizes and it shows us the impact which diet is likely to have. It's amazing. Now, we talk a lot on the show and within Zoe, actually, about the difference between years of life mm -hmm. and years of healthy life. Yeah. Because I think many people listening to this will sort of be aware in a way that maybe they weren't when they were young, that there's yeah. a huge difference. And that yeah. many of us might be stuck with this awful thing of like years, maybe even decades of very like low quality life yeah. because we've lost, you know, the, um, the health that gives us sort of the pleasure. Yeah. Is this just about years of life or does it actually add years of healthy life? It's really about healthy life years, Jonathan, because what we also know is that the diseases that cause these chronic years of ill health are mostly diet-related diseases. So when we have, we know that for some people over two decades of their lives will be spent in chronic ill health. And the main drivers for that are heart disease. So for example, having um, heart failure. There are also things like type 2 diabetes and then also cognitive decline. Now, all of those three things are hugely impacted and preventable with dietary change. So by changing to a much healthier dietary pattern and knowing what works for us at each life stage, we can actually not only lengthen our life, but prevent these main causes of chronic ill health. And Federica, I think you've talked quite a bit about the sort of general shape of um, healthy eating. You were talking yeah. about your, th your 30s, and I'm guessing that's going in a bit into your... We're, we're moving on, yeah. <laughs> into your 40s. Yeah. What changes, if anything, as you get, you know, Midlife. later into life? And, yeah. and I think maybe let's skip over menopause just because we're not going to have enough time and we should yeah. do something dedicated on, on that. Mm -hmm. What about as we get um, sort of past that, past that yeah. um, stage for both, you know, women and men. Yeah, so you're right there. There is this um, window of opportunity. There is a window of opportunity in menopause because of the physiological and metabolic changes. And with men, there is still this, what's called the andropause. There is this change in testosterone levels. Um, and it is nowhere near as dramatic as the menopause, but there is still a change. And for many men, it, it's a, a noticeable physiological change. So I don't think it's not to dismiss that. And as we look into sort of 55 to 65, there's a section of life which is sometimes referred to as sniper alley, which is not great, but you know. Sniper alley. I call it twilight zone. Uh, okay, yeah. that doesn't sound much better. It doesn't sound great, yeah. but it is this, this sudden age bracket where we see an increased risk of death from disease. So up and until... And specifically for men you're talking both about. Both men and women, men but and men women. is higher. Um, and up and until so this point... after menopause for most women. Yes. And, and then, for men you're saying there is some changes. It's not the equivalent to menopause, no. but there are sort of hormonal changes yes, in this period as well. there are, but the risk for men doesn't come from the hormonal change, whereas the menopause actually does increase risk for women. For men, it's more of an accumulation of risk factors earlier in life. And because men don't have estrogen protect, protecting them, uh, that, that risk factor sort of accumulates 
more over over that time frame. And it's called Sniper Alley or Twilight Zone because this is when you suddenly start seeing that people you know or people that you you hear about start dying from heart disease mostly. And it's it's important to know this because what we talked about, making those changes in your sort of 30s and 40s, can actually really effectively prevent this increased risk window. And we need to be aware that if we continue with dietary habits and other lifestyle habits that are not supporting our health, there is a very real chance that we'll suffer something in this time frame. And we need to support ourselves better to enter midlife because if you enter midlife really healthy, then your likelihood of actually continuing into your later years in good health is much higher. If in midlife you suffer with, say, a heart disease or you have really high blood pressure, then you, it's just a harder change to then make to reverse that damage. So, and Federica, is there anything specifically that you're talking about then as we go into later yeah. life that is different about the dietary advice yeah. um, from what you've been talking about in these earlier stages? Yes, there is. So as we get older, there's a few things that happen and, and it means that we become slightly less efficient at absorbing nutrients and also utilizing them. So this is really talking... 65 plus, but also in this midlife period, it becomes really important to go back to these principles of having a high nutrient diet, but also making sure that we're not over consuming energy dense foods because our metabolism and our lifestyles often don't allow for that. So our metabolic flexibility, which is what we were talking about earlier, how our our body clocks are become a little bit less like punchy. So when we're really young, you know, our insulin increase in the morning is really marked. You can, when you look at the 20-year-old, their insulin in the morning goes right up, ready to have the breakfast and make the most of it. That really starts to like flatten as we get older. So your ability to cope with the uh, cake or whatever yeah. is just much lower. Is that exactly, what you're saying? Yeah. Earlier? And so we have to be aware of that and feed our bodies food that are, is a bit kinder to the metabolism. And also because our metabolism is changing, we are become less efficient at absorbing and putting nutrients in the right place at the right time. So the biggest concern in people over sort of 70, 65, 70 years, their appetite tends to be reduced. And actually, this is when thirst starts to be a little bit less efficient. So people worry like in their 20s about making sure they get enough water, but really that's not an issue. We don't need to be carrying like 20 litre jugs of water with us at that age. Our thirst response is really good when we're younger. We get thirsty, we drink. As we get older, that's less efficient. So the risk of dehydration starts creeping up. And what's really crucial here is that if you're in your 70s and you live alone, and perhaps you have a bit of arthritis on the hands, or perhaps you don't have all of your own teeth, it is much easier to eat very soft, easy to eat, easy to handle ultra processed foods. And ultra processed foods, aside from being like low in nutrients, are also incredibly dry. It's one of the ways that they have such a long shelf life. So whereas it's great for us to get some water from our food, from fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, soups and stews, they're all quite naturally hydrating foods. If when we're older, we start reverting to uh, cake bars and biscuits, mostly because they're just easy to eat, then we also lose the opportunity to hydrate through our food. And so, I'm guessing they're also just not good not for you nutrient, because yeah, they're not all, enough nutrients. Yeah, and, and but also the ultra processed food itself yeah. is likely to be having negative. There is impact. no positives to them. Yeah. <laughs> so with older people, if they become malnourished, if they become dehydrated, it is a much worse picture. So it's a much more severe effect. So you know, an elderly person who's dehydrated could easily fall over and fracture their hip, for example. That's something we really want to avoid. So making sure that we nourish the older people in our lives, or if there's somebody listening to this and maybe they're 70 and they're approaching their 70s, I have clients who are in their 70s, embracing nutrient-dense foods, um, making like these really delicious soups and stews with beans and lentils and whole grains and making the most of these foods that we know are brilliant at nourishing us and they are naturally hydrating and they naturally help with decreasing the risk of constipation, which is a huge problem later in life, then, you know, we can really help someone's quality of life and we can add extra life years. 